All right, good morning. Welcome, everybody. Brand new week. Uh, no brand new topic. So the brand new topic is you making up the topics this morning. So it's an open, open mic session this morning, so we can chat whatever's on your mind. So uh, I know somebody who's always got a lot on his mind is Trevor. So I'm going to kick off with Trevor this morning. So you really don't want to start with me because um, I think I've been confronted with or just dumped upon uh, with tons and tons of negativity. Um, and it's perhaps my own fault uh, because okay, I've so been we, 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 we're, switching, we're switching off there. We don't want to know about negativity. So, <laughs> Well, I, no, but I think it's very important because uh, I actually wrote down uh, a little statement um, that was based on some feedback that uh, Ed gave uh, on Elon Musk. And I was so blooming annoyed with him um, that I sat down and I said, no, man, uh, there's something going on. And I'm tying the, the statement that I wrote down together with all the negativity that actually came in. And I'm questioning Ed. And I, I know you won't mind me pushing his buttons on this. Um, and... But the negativity that actually came through was just looking at the 47 mass murders happening in the States in the last month, um, what was happening, what's happening around in all over the world. We're just confronted with this negativity. Then I was stupid enough to watch carte blanche and, and watched all the attacks on courier companies. Uh, and then down the road, um, a manager was shot in Broad Acres yesterday. Um, a whole lot of people shot and killed. Uh, he headed up uh, Liquor Town. And, and there's just so much of this negativity around. But the statement I wrote after uh, Ed was talking about Elon Musk, and I'll bring this together, Ed, I think, um, was what's amazing about this? Um, I just think it's our natural disposition to look for the negative first before we actually look for the positive. And in writing that little statement, and I'll write it down as others are talking about, uh, when I said, what's amazing about this, I was actually commenting in my mind on, on Ed turning around and saying, no, Elon Musk, he doesn't want to deal with him anymore because he was selling off his things to carbon credits. And, and I'm sitting here and saying, no, but, you know, I'm just blown away by this guy, Elon Musk. He has made billions. And out of those billions, he has someone like Ed who could go to him and say, okay, Elon Musk, you've got so much now. Give me a billion so that I can do something positive about climate change. Um, and, and I was wondering, is it because Ed suffers from what I see as um, a natural disposition and tendency to negativity? I don't know. I don't know, Ed. I just love Ed. Uh, and, and my little statement is, what's amazing about Ed? I've just gone out there and I say, man, one, two, three, I like this guy. Um, but is he, as much as I like Ed, is he coming across with a natural disposition towards negativity? And then all this negativity dumped into my head over the weekend. And I opened up this morning saying, hey, all this negativity, how do I balance between this wanting to look at things from a positive perspective and us being hammered left, right, and center by all this negative input. And, and how do we take that and make positive things happen? So I'm going to write that statement down. Ed, uh, I don't know if I pushed your buttons there uh, because you pushed mine, whether you have a natural tendency towards negativity and I try to have a natural tendency towards uh, being positive. Uh, so uh, that's my little soapbox. Stop laughing at us to be so we're all for so we're allowed to do <laughs> All right. So, all right. So I think, well, in that case, we just simply have to go, go across to Ed and see, see where this, uh, this road takes us. So, Ed, over to you. Yeah, that, that's quite interesting, actually, because... Um, when Lee said open mic and we were presented with really a blank piece of paper, I didn't know what to think about. So I turned to Trevor for inspiration. 
And uh, I remember a couple of days ago, you know, I think or maybe on Thursday or Friday, he said I was unhappy. Um, I'm, I'm not unhappy. Um, so I thought, that's it. I'll talk about happiness. But I thought, well, I won't talk about my happiness. I'll talk about so on a national scale and an international scale. So I started doing some research and I pretty quickly came across um, the World Happiness Report, which is produced by the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network. That's a mouthful, isn't it? Um, and it, it, they, they produce a report every year and every year it has a slightly different slant. And, and I focused on 2018 because it was also looking at immigration as well uh, and migration. Um, I hope you can hear me all right. I've got a bit of a, a, a my screen's not behaving itself. Um, so I looked at 2018 and, and what was quite, it, and, and, it, and it, it, it uses a thing called the Cantrell Ladder, or well, sorry, the Cantrell Ladder, which is a subjective way of asking, basically the We seem to have seem to have lost it there for a moment. He asked people, "Are you happy?" It's a bit more complex. So it's got a. Am I back? Uh, you are now. Yeah. Where, where did I get to? Uh, something about Cantrell, I think it was. Yeah, it's a, they, they used the Cantrell um, ladder, which is basically ask people how happy you are. But it's a bit more complex than that. But it's been about since about 1965, so it's quite well used. And then they use data from Gallup, the, 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 the big polling people. It's a massive piece of work. Anyhow, of the top 10 countries, about the top five are um, Nordic countries. And in the bottom half of the top 10 are, are countries like New, New Zealand, Australia, and Canada. And then they looked at, well, what makes up that sort of, why are they happy? And they sort of looked at, um, gross domestic product per capita, healthy life expectancy, social support, freedom, trust, that's the absence of um, corruption and generosity. So whether people give to charity or not. And they found that to explain why these countries were happy, the most important thing was social support, which is having relatives or friends that you can rely on for help. Pretty close to that was, was um, GDP. Um, and then came healthy life expectancy. And then also choice, whether you had a whether you felt you had a choice in what you did in your life. Um, and I thought, well, I wanted to investigate the GDP aspect a bit, bit more. I wanted more granularity because GDP is a very broad measure. Um, so um, I started doing a little bit of investigation and I came across a thing called the Easterlin Paradox, which reminded me of that Ray Carswell or Carswell video that, that um, Trevor got us to watch. Now that's an hour of my life I'm never getting back. Um, and, and Ray Carswell used a lot of graphs to show how great America was and how great it was doing. And this is perhaps why I'm a bit negative. You know, he showed this graph that showed the ever-growing increase in per capita income in America. And he used that to show that things were good. Well, he'd obviously never heard of the Easterlin paradox, or he knew about it, but didn't mention it because it was inconvenient. Because what the Easterlin paradox shows is that up to a certain point, increasing income makes you happy. Then it doesn't. And in fact, it, in, in the, the US over the last seven decades, happiness has either stood still or decreased. Whereas GDP has increased, has tripled. So that's um, quite interesting, I thought, that actually only a certain amount of income makes you happy. Um, and, and, and I then looked at the more granularity. I looked at a couple of indexes. 
one looks at the ratio between the bottom 10% of earners and the top 10% of earners. So hey, how big is that difference? And, and the other one is a thing called the Gini um, index, G-I-N-I, which is actually a sort of um, quantified representation of a thing of, of, of a nation's Lorenz curve. If you want to Google it, it, it it's fascinating. And it, it then disappears into some really complex statistics and you can have great fun in there. Um, so yeah, you know, Trevor, I'm happy. I, I loved the research. I was really, really happy. But what interested me was when you looked at both of those statistics, the ratio between the poorest 10% and the richest 10% and the Gini index, and the lower the number on the, both those indexes, the less the inequality in income. The top 10 in happiness had an average index of about nine for the 10% one and about 29 for the Gini index. South Africa, which in 2018 was 106 in the happiness index, although it's clawed its way up to 76 now, on those two scales, on the 10% scale, it's 33. And on the uh, Gini scale, it's 63. So there's a strong correlation, and I know correl yeah, correlation doesn't mean causation, but there's a strong correlation between income equality and happiness. And I did a tiny bit of research, and then I kind of ran out of time. Um, but in America, some of the research has shown that it's not your income that makes you happy. It's really where you feel you are on the scale. And of course, the, 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 the narrower the scale, the closer you are to the top. So people in, in, say, countries like Finland, Norway, Denmark, Iceland, Switzerland, the Netherlands, etc., where there's very little spread in income, probably feel that they are closer to the top than people in, say, South Africa, <laughs> where some people in South Africa are miles away from the top. Um, but it was also interesting that, that, that the, the bigger elements were, in fact, those, those ones I mentioned of GDP, social support, and having a feeling of choice. Corruption came into it, but not very much. So that's me. I, I investigate happiness. And, and, and um, I find it interesting that, that, that Trevor should think my valid criticism is actually negativity. It's not. It's just not believing every message that someone puts out. If Tesla wants to say they're green, they are not green. And in fact, my, my, my environmental blog made that point again this week with another thing. Um, because Facebook just came out and said it was totally um, carbon neutral, which is fantastic. I mean, Facebook have done an amazing amount of stuff to, to, to reduce their consumption, but it said it was 100%, you 100% used renewable energy, but it doesn't because the grid can't supply Facebook with enough renewable energy. So Facebook relies on renewable energy credits to make up for the times when um, the grid can't buy it. So it's not Facebook's fault. They're trying to do it, but they can't achieve it. But because of the credits, they're allowed to say they have. But I've got no criticism of Facebook's green credentials whatsoever. I've got a criticism of the system that allows them to make statements like that which, although not incorrect, aren't true. That's me, and I'm happy. I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy. And the UK comes in at 15th on the happiness index. Although that was in 2018, we've now swapped places with um, the USA. They're now 15th, and we're 18th in the latest one that came out. But that was affected by COVID. All right, thanks, Ed. Yeah. Uh... Okay, all very interesting stuff. Uh, how did they say statistics, statistics and damn lies? Uh, something, something like that, anyway. <laughs> yeah. 
I love I, I, I love to hate statistics. Anyway, so Ish, welcome back. We haven't seen you for a week or two. And uh, glad to have you with us this morning. As you can hear, we're going all over the show this morning. So I'd love to hear what's on your mind this morning. Well, I, I was fascinated by what Ed was mentioning. Happiness, I think, is, is a combination of a lot of things. Out of which the as as he mentioned, the security of your health that that lies right on the top. Because say if I if I talk about here in India, if you are Medical is, is one of the, the things that everybody is worried about because it, the, the government health facilities is not good. And if you are thinking about getting into a private uh, facility, you need to have a very good uh, insurance plan uh, for you. And then uh, again, it, 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 happiness is for me is all about balancing your wants and needs. Anybody who is able to strike a balance between what you want and what you need would would always remain happy yes that you would not always get what you want and you would also not always get what you need striking that balance is, is where the happiness lies anybody who masters that uh, would be happy and anybody who does not whatever country he lives in would would all he would always be on the uh, lower scale of happiness for me that, that, that's all about happiness because I, I tend to be on the other scale a lot of times, not not balancing the wants and needs. And sometimes the, the situation is such that even if you try and balance them, you're not able to. But striking that balance is, is the key. And that's where happiness lies. Right, thanks. Yeah, I think that's a, that's, that's a good analogy. So uh, I'm going to go across to the, the pastor in the group uh, because, uh, you know, I think there's a, there's a statement that says that I've, I've learned to be uh, content with little and as I've learned to be content with much. So that's one. I'm going to have a late one for us. <coughs> uh, thank you, Ivan. And when I finish, you can then uh, lead with a song and take up collection and we will close the meeting. So uh, uh, I like uh, I like watching the, the, the interaction between actually two great minds on the, on the group, uh, Trevor and uh, uh, Ed but also how they uh, find very clever ways of uh, needling each other. And uh, I loved, uh, at, at first of all, uh, Trevor nailing him, and then Trevor, uh, Ed coming back to say, uh, I went to Trevor for inspiration, but then I struck a blank. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, uh, we have an interesting uh, conversation going here. But I'll, I'll just stick with... Uh, the the open mic uh, uh, invitation and i think my contribution is to say be in the moment uh, and maybe ivan uh, prophetically you said all right let's uh, uh, be content in all things but uh, so so that was my be in the moment and how it came to me this this weekend uh, yesterday we had a big family do uh, helen's sister uh, turned 60, but then also uh, her daughter, who is married to a young in engineer, uh, they found a great uh, blessing in their life. And uh, early this year, he was headhunted for a job in Brussels. Uh, and uh, within about a month, the, 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 the wife also found a permanent job. She's an accountant. And, you know, as young people, their world is just all of a sudden opened up company cars, paid in euros, lifestyle. Uh, but the sadness is now she's very close to her mom and mom is very close to daughter. So that this now lies ahead uh, in a month's time. So uh, yesterday was uh, uh, one of those, uh, the, 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 the surface celebration was uh, the birthday, but below the surface was this knowledge that this is also a saying goodbye that in a month's time, uh, this young couple will be emigrating. But then to make it a big day, and we literally had people ranging from uh, 90 years old to young kids at three, four years old playing and running. And for the kids, we put up a, a, a inflatable a castle, and they were jumping all their energy away on the castle during the day. And it was just one of those days that, um, 
you know, you, you, you uh, filled your emotional battery with just glimpses, a little bit of a chat here, a little bit of a chat there. And for long, I would actually go and sit uh, just on uh, the patio and watching the all their energy away at, uh, at the castle uh, and see their interplay. And uh, how we cannot remember how we were uh, in that age group uh, zero to six. Uh, I don't know when people start to remember the incidents in their lives, but there was a bunch of happy, happy kids and they won't remember a thing of it in a couple of years time. And uh, we as adults can now watch them and appreciate that maybe we were there once and enjoy the moment. So uh, I think what I want to say is uh, let's, let's not, doesn't matter what happened. You know, fires are going to happen and it's sad, all the stuff that happened. And when it happened to you, it's very, very sad and you lose it all. But while it hasn't happened, uh, what can you enjoy out of the moment? Uh, uh, and uh, it also, and, and for me, it says what matters. And I made a note there to say what matters is health, relationships, and significance. And significance is your sense of feeling I'm making an impact in a difference. And it doesn't matter whether you're recognized by the world or not, or what people call you names and stuff like that. As long as you feel I'm making an impact. And then it brought me to the last uh, thing that just jumped in my mind was to to think of uh, uh, the power of purpose. So when you have a powerful purpose, now whether that powerful purpose is to uh, clean the environment uh, and mobilize a, gr a group of youngsters and clean up the rivers and pick up the plastic or whether it is to put a soup kitchen in or to start a business, but it's a power of purpose, then uh, resources doesn't matter because I think what that power of purpose then do is to give you such a, a, a sharp focus and a strong awareness to pick up clues around you to say, where will my resources come from? And, and you will find resources. So, uh, yeah, so uh, I think with that, be in the moment, have a strong sense of purpose and, uh, uh, you know, uh, ask yourself what matters. Thank you. Yeah, I think all good things. And uh, yeah, it is just jumping for the castle. So, um, but yeah, <laughs> that's a whole different topic. But to be so, what's on your mind this morning? I saw you just got delivery of a newspaper. So, you know, uh, terrible things, those. <laughs> okay, um, morning, everyone. Um, what I'm talking about today is about a book that I'm actually reading now. Um, it's called The Gulag Acapelico by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, you know, um, it is actually about a book about, you know, 20th century Russia, you know, it talks about communism, you know, um, in the period of Lenin and Stalin. And, you know, the book is pretty long. It has three volumes and it centers around death, <laughs> prison, you know, hard labor, suffering, war, and, you know, the concentration camp. It's just like, you know, there's this movie by Martin Scorsese. It's called The Irishman, you know. Um, the book is just like The Irishman in the sense that um, we get exposed to death from the get-go, you know, from the first scene to absolutely the last scene, you know. So I found um, the book interesting because, you know, in the book, people got, you know, their freedom taken away, you know, just like that, you know. Um, it didn't matter if you did, if you were like a spy or you were just like an ordinary person, you know, like everyone was getting arrested, you know, um, you would get 10 year sentence for nothing, you know, um, it's, it's a really hard book. And um, I guess what I gather from the book is that it is important, you know, to, to be grateful, you know, for life and just be in the moment, you know, and do what you can, because, you know, the book talks a lot about, you know, um, suffering. Um, a lot of people suffered because they were like taken away, you know, from their families and, you know, 
families would get like arrested and they would get separated, you know, so that they may never see each other again, you know. And after they've like arrested you, you'd be um, a lot of, they would do things to you, you know, in order to, for you to actually accept uh, a crime that you have, you don't know anything about, you know, so they use as a form of interrogation or to actually coerce you into admitting something that you haven't done. They use things like starvation, you know, um, people were actually beaten to a pulp, you know, and death was like a norm. Um, people were shot behind their head for no apparent reason. There was this total disregard for life. And it kind of like makes you um, think about life in a different perspective, because I think that death, when used correctly, it can actually propel you to actually live out your life to the best, to the maximum, because um, we all have, as soon as we are born, right? Um, it is a sentence of death. Um, it is a guarantee, you know? So if you use a life correctly, it can actually propel you um, because you get to realize that um, you're already here, you know, like you're already naked, you know, in a sense, you might as well do everything you can while you still have the moment, you know? So um, because of the suffering that the book has inflicted on me, you know, in terms of my, my the way how I see things, I've learned to be grateful, you know, to actually love the people around you, you know, care, care about what you're doing, you know? I learned that I'm lucky and that at least in a sense, I still have my freedom, you know? So I can do this and I can do that. Um, and it is because of death that I know how to live. <laughs> I don't know if it makes sense, but um, this whole thing of death and how the injustices that I've actually read in the book, you know, um, it has actually made me a better person, you know? Um, so yes, um, that's, that's what I can say, you know, for now, um, that the Buleg Acapelico, you know, it actually helped me and, um, cause you know, there were, oh man, there were, there were like crazy things, you know, like people would get shot, you know, and their bodies would just be left out in the open, you know, for the bodies to actually decompose. And if you were lucky, you know, to actually have a burial that actually one box for two people, you know, that's if you're lucky. And some prisons actually use like a box for six people, you know. So um, ah, I don't want to talk about that that much, but I think what I want to say is that um, from the book, I actually get it that death is good, you know. So um, thank you, thank you, um, thank you, Ed. <laughs> Thanks, uh, thanks to be so. Yeah, I think uh, it's, it's good when one can take um, you know positive inspiration out of out of things like that. Um, so well done for that. Carpe diem, as they say, seize the day. Uh, the present, the present is the only true gift that you have. All right, Lee, let's get across to you. Thank you. So I think my topic uh, picks up uh, a little bit on what Jasper was talking about. And uh, so, yes, have had some big family events, but um, I this just in this last couple of days um, have started meeting up with friends and family face to face, uh, sort of in in coffees, uh, which I haven't done in a long, long time. And uh, had one breakfast with a friend of mine who's been a friend for many, many years. Um, and actually, uh, her parents died when she was fairly young, and um, and and so would spend Christmases with us, spend holidays with us. And she was also single. She only got married when she was in her early forties, um, and so she she 
our mind and in her mind, she was family. She is family. Uh, and uh, so even though officially she's a friend, she's in our family circle. And then I had um, breakfast, uh, uh, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. Um, I had um, coffee with uh, my sister-in-law and I say my sister, so she's family, um, but my brother and her are actually divorced. So, uh, uh, but she remains, even though she's divorced and my, and my brother has another uh, partner, um, she remains part of our family. And so I was just thinking about the nature of family and how my traditional idea of uh, the Western nuclear family of mom and dad and kids, uh, how that's just changed and, 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 and we've learned and grown. Um, another example of that is my daughter is, um, her boyfriend is divorced and has two little ones and they almost certainly will get married and, uh, and so we'll have this another additional extension to our family uh, that um, will be this uh, a family that's mixed in and melded together rather than a, a, a this set family. So that's really what I was talking about. Sorry, it's, I find, it's find it quite hard to, to talk when I feel like no one's listening. <laughs> but um, so uh, uh, in terms of, a, oh, Ivan, Ivan, please share, share. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that, I think it's interesting how the, the topic is essentially uh, centered around uh, you know happiness I'm going to use that word because uh, I think you know with the, the way Trevor started was with a lot of unhappiness um, and then try to, to bring it around the back and you know and say what is really good and then Ed went on to the happiness thing and then Jasper you know followed that with that trend uh, you know issue as well um, to be so sort of taking us down Trevor's route and then managed to bring it back again so yeah I think happiness is obviously something that is that is very central to to people, the way we think, you know, the way we want to think, the way we want to be. Um, and, and I, you know, for me, I think the, the danger is that we can allow ourselves to be submerged in unhappiness because that's what the media and everybody else puts out. And, uh, you know, it, it, I, I, I don't, I don't understand uh, people's, uh, obsession with the news, let's put it that way. Um, because I, I, I think a lot of it is is meaningless. Um, and in the, in the greater scheme of, of your individual's life. Uh, and guess what, you'll get onto uh, into a discussion and everybody will tell you what the news is anyway. So why bother to watch it or read it anywhere else? Because uh, you're going to get it from someone during the course of the day in any case. So yeah, I, th I think happiness is important. I think, um, I think, you know, the way the way we live our lives is important um and uh and and i think it's all got to start with us at home so yeah i think in a nutshell that's that's me so back to back to you for for the topic for tomorrow um so the word freedom has come up and i you know edward used it to be so used it and uh and we we've sort of so, and I think that might be interesting in terms of um, if we relate it to happiness or however you want to relate to it. But what is freedom? What is freedom? What does it mean to be free? Um, that's the question I would like us to think about tomorrow. All right, great. Thanks. Yeah, yes, Joe. No, I've, I've, I've got to have a comeback comment to Lee. Uh, how dare she say that we are not listening? Uh, I think that is sexist. Um, obviously, if we're not staring you in the eye and nodding at every blooming syllable, you think we can't multitask? Has that got something to do with us being males? 
Um, uh, and, you know, I don't have to be looking at you to <laughs> listen, but that was quite an interesting comment I've, that you I've made. definitely heard that argument more than once. You <laughs> <laughs> uh, said. Yeah, I, I, in some ways I do support um, Lee because I think, you know, if you're having a lot of chat in the chat, you are taking your your train of thought away from what that person's saying. So. Um, while I totally agree with Trevor, we can listen and do stuff at the same time. I think it does dilute your concentration. Um, so apologies, Lee. No, 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 no. Uh, listen, uh, and this is where I want to jump in. I think people on Zoom technology have got this all wrong. Um, that they expect us to be sitting around a boardroom table and looking and hanging on every single word of the actual talker. I don't think this technology is about that at all. Uh, this technology allows you the comfort of actually being able to be in your remote home office environment with a thousand things on the go and actually grabbing some things that other people are talking about. And I think what what you've got to do as the talker or whoever is conveying whatever they want is not focus on the chat. Uh, you only talk into the screen and leave the chat alone. Uh, I've never looked at the chat whenever I've been talking, only afterwards. And then I've been shocked at what Ed has put in that particular <laughs> chat forum. But it doesn't not, distract you at all. Not wishing to prolong this um, any further. I thought it was, but I'm going to. I thought it was quite interesting. It, Trevor said, grab some things. And of course, the thing with grabbing some things is you might have missed that little gem that you didn't grab. And, and I'm reading a book at the moment called The Impact Code. And it's all about being in the room. It says, you know, either be in the room or don't be in the room, which I think is quite interesting. Um, but yeah, you know, I, 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 I see the point that both like sides. To, I would like to comment because I really was not meaning to point fingers and to be all critical. However, I need you to know. So what, hap I mean, what, what happens to me when I, um, so it's not about what's happening in the chat, it's the disengagement. And um, I lose my thoughts. So I, it's obviously something that's happening in my brain, but I honestly cannot, it's like my brain goes into sludge and perfectly wonderful conversation that I thought I was going to have. I can't find my words. So explain that to me. And I will, I will, I will. It's because you demand attention. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. I, no, I no. wait because I want to go running. I don't want to bring this to a close. I want to go running. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. okay. Freedom, freedom, freedom. We all need some freedom. Freedom <laughs> from this. <laughs> so have a great day, um, further folks, and uh, we're going to chat about freedom tomorrow. If you'll see that. Realize yeah. one thing: I'm I'm not a psychologist. So I haven't got a clue what it means. <laughs> have a good one. See you tomorrow.